Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today on the table here for you, I have a couple Colt Pythons. I have the new release here from 2020 from Colt, and I have a Python here from 1981. The point of this video is to do a point by point comparison of the two. So if you are interested in either getting a 2020 Python, or maybe you're looking at finding an older Python, kind of what the differences are and which one might be best to fill that particular hole in your collection. Election. Uh, anyway, if that all sounds interesting to you, let's go ahead and jump into it now. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the specs with these two, starting here with the 2020 Colt Python. Now, this one is offered as of right now only in stainless. I do not believe that they're going to come out with a blued version, and I'll get to into that sort of at the end in the final takeaways. Now, this one here is a six inch barrel. They also did just release one with a four and a quarter inch barrel. Now, for purposes of this video, I'm going to refer to this as the original Python. I know that this is an original Python too because it's also made by Colt, but it's easier for me to call this the original Python and this one the new Python or this one the 2020 Python. So with that being said, coming up to the original Python. Now they were originally offered and several barrel lengths, two and a half, three, four, six, and eight. This one here is a four inch. Of course, of those barrel lengths, as of right now, they're just doing the four, four and a quarter, and six inch here. These were also originally offered in blue and nickel. Actually, the bluing on here is a very high polish, a very nice, beautiful, beautiful blue. At the time at Colt, they referred to this as the Python blue, but it was more known commercially as Colt's Royal Blue finish. It's a very high polished uh, sort of uh, sheen underneath the uh, underneath the blue wing, which is, just gives it an overall beautiful appearance that we definitely did not see on firearms from the time period and don't really see a whole lot of today. Okay, now getting into a measurement of the two, and I know they're two different barrel lengths, but I'll go ahead and use the front of the frame as a reference point. So from the bottom of the trigger guard up to the sight, well, actually I'll just go to the top of the frame, we are at three and three quarter inches. And here on this python, three and a half. So there is uh, about a quarter of an inch difference on the height from the bottom of the trigger guard to the frame. Going from the front of the frame to the back of the frame, do the bottom of the sight base here. We are at two and seven eighths. And here we are at uh, between two and seven eighths and three inches. So frame sizes between the two are almost exactly the same. Okay, bringing in the original Colt Python. Of course, like I said, this is the four inch barrel and you're gonna notice the two uh, vents right there at the top, very iconic for a Colt. Now, the front sight is a ramped front sight held in place by two pins. It was normal to see a single pin design and this is going to be a change on the 2020 version, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, the target crown on here does protrude out to the exterior of the barrel and barrel lug. Again, is going to be a change on the new model, which I'll get to in a second. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the roll markings here. Python 357 and then 357 Magnum CTG. And of course the ejector sits there in the bottom of the barrel lug there. Now bringing in the new Colt Python, you're gonna notice a couple differences. Of course, first the vent ribs and this on the original six inch model was exactly the same. There'd be three vents there. There's a barrel lug there. The front sight is ramped, it does have a orange sort of insert there. Now, later Colt Pythons would also have this type of sight. Now, this is actually pinned through the front and can be changed by the user. Uh, typically, on the older Pythons with those cross pin designs, if you wanted to be very careful without marring up any type of the front sight base or the, or the uh, ventilated rib there at the top, it was good to take it to a gunsmith or, eat, or know what you were doing. Replacement can be done by a typical user uh, with really no type of uh, risk of damaging the firearm there, but still care should be uh, observed when doing that. Now, this brings us to the front of the barrel. It is target crowned as well and recessed into the barrel and uh, not protruding past the barrel and the lug. This is gonna give added protection to the crown so you don't damage it or anything like that. Now there are those roll markings there on the left-hand side of the barrel, Python 357. They are a little bit different. Ejector there on the bottom of the barrel lug. Now moving into the frame, I absolutely love the finish on a Colt Python. It has a beautiful blued finish. Of course, extends down to the trigger as well. Your Colt Pony. Cylinder stop moves to the rear. It's just typical of a Colt. Now up at the top is sort of this matte finish. The rest of it's a very high polished blue and an adjustable rear sight. You're gonna notice the top of the hammer spur is also checkered and there's nothing better than that smooth, glassy action of a Colt Python. Now a couple of things we're gonna notice here is the placement 
the side plate seams, which is almost laterally right over the trigger. And here, just before you hit the bottom of the frame, or I guess where you would say the grip panels are covering the frame. One other thing of note while we are here is there is a cylinder stop, little cylinder bumper, if you will, right there. And we're not gonna see that on the new one, and I'll point that out in a minute. Also, pay attention to the thickness right here on the top strap of the frame, just below the rear sight. Now, bringing in the 2020 Python for comparison, starting in that point, you're gonna notice it is a little bit more beefed up. Uh, advertised by Colt of about having 30% more material in that area. Moving up to the top, it is also an adjustable rear sight, just like on the 1982 Colt Python I just showed you. Now, the back of the hammer spur is actually serrated and not checkered. Um, Grip-wise, it's totally fine. You definitely have enough there to, to grip onto, but in my opinion, not as elegant as the original Colt Python. Marking-wise here, there is the serial number and a UID code that Colt puts on all their products. I wish that they had left that off. And then on this side, you're gonna notice the panel seam on this end is almost in line with the front of, this, of the trigger. On the original one, it would have stopped about right here. The panel seam here is in about the right place. Uh, maybe actually a little bit lower on this reproduction. On the original one, it was just a tad bit higher, but that's not really a big issue. Also, you're going to notice that there is no little cylinder stop studs sticking right there, cylinder bumper, whatever you want to call it. Of course, to retract the cylinder is much the exact same way, a rearward motion of the cylinder release. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the grip panels on the original Colt Python. It is a two-piece walnut set, which is checkered here. It does have a yellow gold-ish Colt medallion, pony medallion right here. It does swoop up right over the top of the frame with a secondary cut right there and a single cross pin screw retaining the grip panels in place. Now the bottom is totally closed off but on the back you're going to see the frame between the two panels and there is a ribbed texture here on the back of the frame. On the new Python it is also a two-piece walnut grip set but there are a few differences. It is checkered and it is retained by a single cross screw holding them in place. Now there is the Colt Pony medallions but it's more of a white gold type of appearance. You do have the same swooped appearance of the grips. This ledge here is more of a smooth contour instead of a stepped contour which you get on the originals. Just like on the original it is closed off at the bottom and open at the back but you are going to notice on the back strap there is no type of ribbing or texturing and it's just totally smooth. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the trigger pull weight in single action, starting here with the original Python. Trigger pulls in at three pounds, one ounce. Now taking a look at the new 2020 Colt Python in single action. Four pounds, one ounce. So we are about a full pound heavier. Now let's go ahead and bring in the triggers for a closer review. Okay, here is the trigger on the original Python. First of all, it is fully metal in construction. It does carry the same really nice royal blue finish all the way down to the trigger. The trigger does swoop down to a nice curve, which almost connects with the bottom of the trigger guard, giving you lots of real estate there for your finger, and it is a ribbed texture. Now I'm gonna go ahead and show you in double action. It is a pretty nice heavy pull. Too heavy probably to show up on the scale but a super clean break. I'm gonna go ahead and show you that one more time. You can stage it there really easily into a nice clean break. Now, one of the things that makes the Python the Python is this very smooth action. I mean, just to describe it, it's like glass. It's like taking two finely, precisely machined pieces of metal and polishing them, lubricating them and just having one slide over the other, which is exactly what they did when they first made these. Going ahead and showing you that on single action. Again, this is about a three pound pull. Start applying pressure right there into a break. One more time. Right there into a break. Very, very nice and refined trigger. Here's a 2020 Python trigger, also metal in construction and has the same stainless finish as we do on the frame. The front of the trigger face is also ribbed. Now, the profile is a little bit different. It is a very, uh, what I want to say, uniform swoop, almost like a very consistent curve here, which is a little bit steeper than on the original Python. And again, barely connects with the bottom of the trigger guard, just shy of it. So here on double action, right there, staged. 
very, very, very clean. Again, very clean brake. Now, this, the hammer. It's very important to see how close they got. And again, I mean, if they nailed, if they had to nail one thing on this gun, it had to be the trigger and the hammer. And I think they did it. I mean, that is, in my opinion, just as smooth and honestly feels great. Now let's go ahead and do it on single action. Remember, this is about four pounds. Start applying pressure. Again, it's a better grip in my hand here. Right there. You can definitely feel the extra pound of weight, but man, I mean, they really did do a good job of getting that trigger almost exactly like a classic Python. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at the sort of characteristic differences, let's go ahead and talk about some takeaways here. And I'm gonna sort of blend in some of the history of the Colt Python to kind of maybe illustrate some points here. So uh, first of all, this is, like I said, the new 2020 Colt Python. It is brand new to the market as of now, January of 2020. This is a four digit serial number in the 1500 range. So a very early gun by all approximations. Now, this was going to basically, in my opinion, when Colt was looking to release the Python again, this was going to satisfy one of two markets. We have to be looking at both uh, the classic Python collectors, people who have an expectation for the original Python and want it to be as original as possible. Also keep in mind, this is a continuation of a firearm that Colt has. This isn't like we see in a lot of reproductions where a different company has made a gun that maybe went out of production 80 years ago and a new company is coming on board trying to make a perfect recreation of that. I don't see that in the new Python. I see this as the Python was a firearm from Colt's lineup. They stopped production of the Python in 2005. They are continuing production now. It is a, this, the same gun from the same line from the same company, uh, but they made some modern revisions to it, some cost-saving revisions, and you know, you've seen some of those, and I'll go over those again. So is this intended to be a exact one-to-one -one scale replica? Is this supposed to be for the Colt Python collector, or is it supposed to be for the modern shooter uh, aficionado uh, who might be looking at a new 357 revolver divorced from the legacy carried on from its previous generations? And I'll, I'll kind of argue a little bit from both points. So getting into that, let's first talk about where the Python originated. So the Python was first released in 1955. It would have stayed in production and in, in main production until about 1997. Uh, between about 1997 and 1999, it did transition over to Colt's Custom Shop where it did stay in production uh, until about 2005. And actually the very last line of Pythons, the very last Python produced was the 50th anniversary Python. So of course it had 50 years in production, went out of production in 2005 for most of us to think we would never see it again. So the Python was meant to be a high-end shooter's gun, but it was always meant to be a production gun. Uh, now it is true in 1955 and 1956, these were basically completely uh, hand-fitted and hand-tuned and hand-finished by basically just two people, and that was Dan Bedford and Al DeJohn from Colt. Now, originally Al Gunther, which was a foreman of Colt, and I'm trying to get my history correct on this, was tasked with the with the task of putting together a new line of production revolvers for Colt. He sat down and he came up with the concept of the Colt Python. Some revisions were made. Actually, it had a full filled barrel, but especially in the longer barrel configurations, it was too heavy. So they uh, drilled out and hollowed the lug and then they added in these lightning cuts. So these are actually intended to be lightning cuts, which gave it the iconic vent rib look. Now, after going into production, of course, like I said, it was known as being a highly tuned and highly precisely finished firearm. And only Colt, Colt only allowed those two individuals to do the finished product. They would even uh, do final polishing on like the hammer strut and all the internal pieces, which gave it that really iconic smooth look. Now, in 1955, these did retail for $150. I actually added that into an inflation calculator and I came up with $1439.60 which is funny, so retail on these was $1,500 when they first released, if we take inflation into account, which is exactly where these are. So these are also being released at right at $1,500. So the price point is very similar there. Is it this similar type of worksmanship or, you know, can they be compared in that regard? Well, like I said, 
Many people who are in favor of the original Colt Python always say it was a hand-finished, hand-fitted firearm. You can never reach those level of precision. There is a 50-50 split on that, and we have to sort of explore both. So hand-fitted, yes. Okay, so if we go back to the technology of the 1950s, we did not have the type of advanced precise machining that we have today. Uh, so you did have to sort of make uh, forged parts of the firearm, which were a little bit oversized, and then they would be stoned and polished down uh, to specific fit of that particular firearm and then assembled. Now, did that happen for the case of all, was that the only way to manufacture firearms in that time period? No, I mean, even as early as World War I, uh, parts are being machined in mass for military firearms, uh, which fit a sort of uniformity in their, uh, in, in their at what I want to say, configuration or their scale, where they could actually be readily replaced and swapped between different firearms. You did not need master gunsmiths to sit at Springfield Armory, uh, fitting together 1903 uh, Springfields and 1917 Enfields and things like that. So the idea of a precise hand fitting was not altogether necessary, but was a lot more common around the time of the 1950s. Now, the hand finishing is a completely different process, okay? You do not have to have people hand finishing. And what I mean by that is going through each individual small internal part and polishing them to fit. Also, this beautiful blue finish comes about by very intense and very precise buffing and polishing of the frame, the barrel, and all the external parts. In fact, at the time, a Colt did require that you had to have something like eight or nine months of experience just in polishing. Uh, just in that art alone, before they would let you anywhere near a Colt Python frame, they would even send you off to a, a special school for about a year to learn the trade. So these were tradesmen putting these together, and no, that was not a requirement of manufacturing at the time. It was very much intended to be a very precise and very well done firearm. Now, by about 1958, demand for the Python was soaring, and they had to ramp up production, so they needed more than just two people doing final finishing on these guns, but the requirement for those final finishers was still very high. They were part of Colt's most experienced, uh, most elite of their gunsmiths, so you did have very high-skilled people putting these together through most of their production. Now, as labor would gain, uh, would be more expensive, uh, skilled tradesmen who knew this type of art were becoming fewer and fewer. Of course, we had to move over to standardized production through the 90s and the 2000s, uh, where we left off in 2005. So is a 2020 Colt Python anywhere near the amount of hand-fitted dedication and attention of an original? No, uh, absolutely not. But if we took modern day production standards and we took, first of all, you would have to find somebody with uh, 30, 40 years gunsmithing experience. You would have to find probably uh, at least 30, 40, 50 people just like that to keep up with the production of the gun. And then you would have to pay them very well. So this might not be a $1,500 firearm. It might be a three or $4,000 firearm if Colt went through the same manufacturing processes as they did on this one. Are we giving up a lot in terms of the quality? I don't believe so. I mean, the trigger is almost exactly spot on. That's where I would have wanted Colt to pay the attention that they paid uh, when they came out with a new lineup of the Colt Python. And so I'm really happy that they went that way. And you know, the, the trigger is, is the main sort of issue. Now, one of the complaints of the original Colt Pythons was timing issues over extended periods of time, extended amounts of use, they could lose time, in which case you would have to get them tuned and retimed again. Uh, I never heard of any type of circumstances where that happened, but then again, I did not grow up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, I grew up in the 80s, but you know, um, I did not hear any particular stories of that. Now, as far as reliability on the new Colt Pythons, they have not been out long enough to see any extensive testing. However, I have already seen of the maybe 10 videos of the Python that exist on YouTube. I have seen a couple of people, including Hickok45, having issues mainly with the cylinder. So the cylinder not advancing and the cylinder locking up where there's, uh, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, clicks on already fired primers because the cylinder is not turning. I've already seen issues of that. Now, before we get too up in arms about that being a, yes, $1,500 firearm that should not have issues, it is a brand new release, a brand new production gun. Need I remind you things even like the SIG uh, 365 do have growing pains. I'm sure Colt will take care of those firearms and their warranty process if you have one. Uh, yes, you know, you likely, if you're having issues, you can send it back for warranty claims. As time goes on, I'm sure they will figure out what those manufacturing issues are and address them. So if this, if this, if these sort of problems persist 
into 2022, 2023, and Colt refuses to, you know, make good on them, then I would be very weary of this as a product moving forward. But right now I'm gonna relegate those as growing pains. Now, the final thing I wanted to end up on is who do I believe that this is for and is it worth the money? So first of all, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the price points of the two. Like I had mentioned, these are going to be retailing brand new at about $1,500. As time goes on, we might might see them cheap down a little bit to maybe $1,300, 1400 uh, Usually prices are a little bit higher on brand new releases. Now, this Colt Python in this type of condition, this is a 1982. They are highly collectible. Um, I would expect this to sell for about $2,400 to $2,600. Of course, uh, pythons in their original boxes and nickel uh, pythons, er, the earlier you go, the more value they, they gain. I've seen pythons go north of four and $5,000 for rarer configurations. Uh, of course, different barrel lengths are going to be a little bit more rare, and I won't get more into the specifics of this being a collector's video. Um, so if we consider this, if we were going to pay $1,500 for a classic Python, what would we get? Well, we would probably get something just like this without the box, but maybe missing about half of its finish and rough shape, but still a functional and usable firearm. Uh, keep in mind at the end of the day, this is still a Colt Python. Despite what anybody thinks about the differences in manufacturing qualities, it is still a Colt Python, and I believe will still hold a place in the Colt Python lineup. Um, especially if you say were to buy one from the first release in 2020, 40 years from now, Colt Python collectors are going to want these pythons too because they are Colt Python. So I do think that as time goes on, it's kind of like classic cars are gonna dip in value a little bit as they're used. And then once we kind of hit the classic standpoint of the older models 10, 20 years from now, they're gonna start escalating in prices. It's exactly what we saw with these. Are you giving up on, on a significant amount of quality between one of these and one of these? I don't think so. Again, we need some more time to see what the uh, ramifications are of their issues that they're having with these. Uh, if Colt fixes them, gets the issues all figured out, and then puts it together, those issues aside, if we just look at the action, the trigger pull, the hammer pull, I mean, everything on this, the actual even finished product, the grips and everything is a very nice looking gun and I think is worthy of being called a Python and standing aside its classic counterparts. Again, keeping in mind for modern day production restraints. Now, if I had $1,500 to spend, should you go ahead and save up another thousand and get yourself a classic Colt Python? That's entirely up to you. Where you what you are paying for that money is purely in collectability. I don't believe that you're doubling the price of this justifies a double uh, of the value in terms of quality. I don't see that. Yes, the quality, you can tell the worksmanship, the craftsmanship is there. At the end of the day, a firearm intended to, to sling around down range at a very high velocity efficiently and effectively with a nice trigger pull and all that, this is gonna do just as well. So really, it, it, it has to boil down to what are your purposes for wanting to purchase a Python. If you want that Python to go hunting with, you don't mind getting it scratched up and stuff, this is a great option. If you want a rare collectible, I would go with one of these, or maybe even still uh, one of the new production ones, hoping that if you hold on to it for a long time, it'll definitely appreciate it in value, and I believe it will. All right, guys, well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. And if you wanna see more videos like this, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting more content. Anyway, guys, I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.